3 phosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, step seven. This is, again, we're in the payoff phase, so we're going to start creating ATP. We have 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate converted to 3-phosphoglycerate. ATP is going to be produced in this step. We multiply this by 2 because we have two pathways simultaneously going on of the three carbon moieties from um, glucose. ATP is going to be produced via phosphorylation, so that is going to be an endergonic step, but it's coupled um, to a, um, a bond breaking, an anhydride bond breaking and releasing energy when we take the phosphate group from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This is known as substrate level phosphorylation. It's a, catalyzing a simple reaction one at a time and it's creating ATP. So at this point in step seven, we have a recovery of our investment. So we haven't made any money yet or um, made any energy yet. Uh, we're at a zero, but that's what we have step 10 for. But let's get to step 10. Um, again, the reaction for step seven is phosphoglycerate kinase. And if we were to add up both the hydrolysis of the anhydride breaking that phosphate off, that is going to be the exergonic part of the reaction. And then the endergonic reaction, um, which we know is 30.5 kilojoules to make that ATP, then if we add it up, then we are going to still be exergonic. So down here, building ATP is 30.5 kilojoules per mole. Breaking the anhydride bond is negative 49.3, so we're still in a negative delta G for uh, step seven. Again, the enzyme is phosphoglycerate kinase. A kinase actually always puts an enzyme on, um, or not an enzyme, it puts a phosphate on onto something else, whereas a phosphatase will take it off. So we're losing the phosphate from carbon number one and creating ATP. Magnesium, again, is going to be a, a cofactor. Our product is 3-phosphoglycerate. So from each glucose molecule, we're going to have two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. OK, so here we're creating energy. So step eight, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate will be converted Step eight is going to be an isomerization of 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate. So simply, we're just going to move phosphate group from C3 to C2. It's a prep step. This is catalyzed by phosphoglycerolmutase. It's a mutase because it's moving a group, a functional group, within its own molecule. Magnesium, again, is participating as a cofactor. So here we go. We're moving. So what we've done, if we, we have moved the phosphate from C3 to C2. It's just a prep step, and now we have 2-phosphoglycerate. And we're just showing you here, the hydroxyl moves down, the phosphate moves up, and that's pretty it. Pre that's pretty much it. Okay, so a pretty simple reaction. All right, step nine, 2-phosphoglycerate is going to be catalyzed by enolase. This one, again, we have magnesium as a cofactor, and we're going to be kicking out water. So it's a dehydration step, and we're ultimately producing the most high energy molecule in the body, which is phosphoenolpyruvate. It has the most energy um, that you can uh, release in this bond, in this anhydride bond right here. It has enough energy to create two, a little bit more than two ATP molecules. Again, so we're kicking out water. It's a dehydration step. And this is catalyzed by enolase. Again, phosphoenopyruvate is going to be the most highly energetic molecules of the body. So step 10. Oh, and by the way, this the energy is like negative 69 
close to that. As far as when we break this anhydride bond, we can, you know, liberate. The problem is that we don't, it's not very efficient because we're only going to create one ATP in this step, even though we have the energy to create two. So we're going to have some heat released at this point. So step 10, PEP is the short term for phosphoenopyruvate. It is going to transfer its phosphor phosphate group to ADP and create another molecule of ATP. Again, we have two phosphoenopyruvates per molecule of glucose. So at this point, we're creating two more ATP molecules. And if we were at zero at step seven, now we have a net ATP production of two. So looking at this, we're going to take the phosphate from C2, remember um, we moved it from C3 to C2, and we're going to be giving it to uh, ADP to create ATP. Um, and then we're left with um, a methyl group down here. Again, we have magnesium as a cofactor. Uh, we have ATP involved. It stabilizes ATP while the enzyme does its job. The enzyme is pyruvate kinase. This is another regulated enzyme. So steps 1, 3, and 10 are regulated. The pyruvate kinase is also going to be allosterically um, controlled by the intermediate in step 3, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Okay, again, the delta G of hydrolysis of PEP is going to be more negative than ATP, more than double. So we have negative 61.9 kilojoules per mole as compared to negative 30.5 kilojoules per mole for ATP. Okay, for the control, we have three steps. We have step one, step three, and step 10 that are controlled. The step one, which was catalyzed by hexokinase, was controlled by end product inhibition, which is glucose 6-phosphate, which was the product of that reaction. If we have a lot of glucose 6-phosphate, that would be an indicator of a lot of energy available. So it would make sense that we want to feed back and turn off the pathway. So then step three, this is our most important step. This is inhibited by ATP. Again, that's another indicator of high energy. And ATP was a substrate as well as an allosteric inhibitor for this um, enzyme, PFK1. And there is a separate allosteric site than the substrate, the active site for ATP. The last step, step 10, is going to be inhibited by ATP as well as activated by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. One more thing I should mention is that there's a separate molecule called fructose 2,6-bisphosphate that is going to be um, part of this metabolic um, control. So we have hexokinase, phosphofructokinase, and pyruvate kinase all working to regulate this pathway. Okay, so here we have allosteric control of the PFK. We have fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, F2, 6P or F2, 6BP. It is going to be an allosteric activator of PFK1. And so when the cell is signaled to create more fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, then it will be activating the breakdown of glucose. It is going to be an allosteric inhibitor of fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. This is in the gluconeogenesis pathway, which I'll discuss on another video. But it makes sense because we have glycolysis going one way and gluconeogenesis going the other, which is essentially the reverse with some differences of glycolysis. So when we have an available uh, concentration or a high concentration of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, it will favor sugar breakdown. So that means that we need energy. Again, high concentration of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, not to be confused with the intermediate, which is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, but fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a separate regulatory 
I guess, effector that will be enhancing PFK or activating PFK and uh, turning down fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase that um, is going to be an enzyme in gluconeogenesis, which is essentially the reverse of glycolysis. Okay, so the concentration of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate in a cell it will depend upon its synthesis, which will be catalyzed by PFK2, the phosphofructokinase 2, again, not to be confused with PFK1, which was the enzyme in step three of glycolysis. And then the breakdown will be catalyzed by fructose bisphosphatase 2. And each of these enzymes are gonna be controlled by phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So if we look at this diagram here, this is synthesis and breakdown of F26P, BP. Remember, if this molecule is present at high concentrations, then glycolysis will be favored, and then by it will inhibit gluconeogenesis. This is, these two enzymes are on a big protein, so we have a big protein with two different enzymatic actions on it. We have PFK2, say on one end, and then F26BPase on another. Here we are going to, okay, when we create, here it says the anabolism of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate, so we're creating it, we're synthesizing it, meaning that we want to activate uh, glycolysis. Then we're going to be activating PFK1. So PFK2 activates PFK1, and it is going to inhibit F16 bisphosphatase, which is in gluconeogenesis. So again, when F26 bisphosphate is created from this dual enzyme here, then we're going to activate glycolysis by activating the third most important enzyme, PFK1. And simultaneously, because the concentration's in the cell, it will be inhibiting gluconeogenesis, which is the reverse of glycolysis. So when we phosphorylase this enzyme with a protein kinase, we're activating it. So when we're phosphorylating it, we're, sim we're signaling the anabolism of the uh, fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. When a phosphatase enzyme dephosphorylates it, then we're gonna favor the catabolism of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. So here we have the breakdown of fructose 2,6 phosphate, and when it does that, it is going to favor gluconeogenesis. Okay, so here we have fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. This is going to be enhanced when it's dephosphor, or I'd say activated this part of the enzyme will be activated whenever molecule is dephosphorylated and it will catabolize fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. So in other words, PFK, which is step three of glycolysis, is the most important enzyme of the pathway. It provides the most important intermediate, we call it the key intermediate, which is fructose 1,6 bisphosphate which also acts as a feed-forward activator of step 10. This enzyme is not only allosterically controlled, but it's also covalently controlled via phosphorylation and dephosphorylation through this enzyme that contains both PFK2, and which is going to favor glycolysis, and F26 BPase, which will favor gluconeogenesis. Dr. Goodwitch signing off for today. See you next time on Dr. Bond's Science Theater.